Hey, what's up everyone? We are going to continue our ventilation chapter 11. We have stopped at resistive forces opposing lung inflation. Friction forces also oppose ventilation. So any friction that opposes ventilation, when you ventilate your patient, anything that when you inhale, any resistance, any frictional force will cause some resistance. So what are those resistance? Let's continue. Frictional oppo opposition forces differ from the elastic properties of the lung and thorax. We covered that in the previous videos. In the previous video that we just did that lungs and thorax have that elasticity, which is and it produces that tension for the lung to go back to its original shape. But now they're talking about any resistance that has to do with force like frictional opposing occurs only when the system is in motion. Frictional oppo opposition to ventilation has two components, tissue viscous resistance and airway resistance. Tissue viscous resistance. Tissue viscous resistance is the impedance of motion opposing to flow. So anything that opposes flow. Caused by displacement of tissue during ventilation. Displaced tissues include the lungs, rib cage, diaphragm, and abdominal organs. So here, what they're saying is, let's say this is the lung, right? So let's say this my arm is the lung, right? You have the diaphragm at the bottom, right? And then you have any organs. Let's say you have any organs, like any, they said here, and abdominal organs, like the small intestine, the large intestine, the liver, anything, any organ that is pressed where it gets in contact with when you inhale, when expanding the thorax, so that the chest is here and those organs are here. So when you inhale, it, it expands, and then those right here, these organs, they become resistant, they become a resistor, they give some type of resistance to inhalation. So you get some type of friction. So this is what they're saying in this sentence here. The frictional resistance is generated by movement of each organ surface sliding against each other. So you see here when I was pointing out that you have organs right surrounding slide against each other. The lung lobes sliding against each other against the chest wall tissue resistance accounts for only approximately 20% of the total resistance to lung inflation. However, in conditions such as obesity, pleural fibrosis, and acidities, means your lung is swollen, the tissue viscous resistance will increase the total impedance to ventilation. There we go. So obese patients tend to have, this is what I've seen in the ICUs. When you try to wean the patients off the ventilator to get them off, Obese patients tends to have a hard time getting them off because when they inhale, they have a lot of resistance that goes against your lung because they have all that fatty tissue that is it causes. So if you have this lung and you have some type of resistance that is hard to move, so the lung try to inflate and it gives you some type of resistance. So this, this paragraph here, explains how any organs, any tissue, such as obesity, the chest wall, and other things, those also play a factor into resistance, friction resistance. Now let's go to airway resistance. Now they're just gonna talk about the airway. Gas flow through the airways also causes frictional impedance called flow resistance, okay? Resistance to ventilation by movement of gas through the airways is called airway resistance. Airway, resist, airway resistance accounts for approximately 80% of frictional resistance to ventilation. So 20% has to do with organs in, in obesity, in, in pleural fibrosis, acidities, and all other factors. But 80% of the resistance is airway resistance. So it's 80%, okay? that has to do with your airway. So you always have to worry about your airway more than the other factors, okay? 
Now gas flow through the airways also causes friction in vehicle, okay? And we read that about 80%. Okay, resistance is defined as the constant of proportionality between pressure and flow. In flow conducting system and is usually expressed in units of centimeters of water per liters per second. So this is the formula you need to know for the test, which is resistance over change in pressure over change in minute volume, okay? To calculate airway resistance, use transthoracic airway pressure instead of change in pressure. To calculate respiratory system resistance, uses airway resistance in healthy adults range from approximately point to 2.0 centimeters to cause gas flow flow into the lungs, 1 centimeter healthy. Okay, these things I'm not going to read this paragraph because you can read this paragraph. It has just numbers that gives out and a lot of the teachers love those numbers so they can ask you uh, test questions airway resistance in non-ventilated patients is usually measured in pulmonary function laboratory flow is measured with pneumotachometer alveolar pressure are determined in a body polythysmograph in an airtight box in which the patient sits this is a box where they, most of the time, this is going to go into PFT, PFT. So people, some people who just do, once they graduate, they do just PFT respiratory, where they measure lung volumes. And, and this is the box that we're talking about that is here. It's an airtight box where you measure the patient's volumes and you compare them to normal and you see if they have uh, diseases such as, you know, uh, COPD, uh, cystic fibrosis, basically to identify the diseases. So it's measures that you, you, you do it at the PFT lab. So this, I guess it's important if your focus is to be a PFT uh, respiratory care practitioner. Okay. This all just goes towards resistance, nose, mouth, distribution of airway resistance, total resistance, nose, mouth, the upper airway, trachea, and bronchi, small airways, two millimeters. Okay, so let's Combined resistance, the right and left main stem bronchi have their own usually different resistance. However, the muscles are ventilated, see a combined resistance because these airways have the same driving pressure but different flows. They are said to be connected in parallel. Parallel compliance combined like comp in the series as follows para resistance the total resistance of para connection is less than of, of the components the bronchial airway resistance is connected in series with upper airway and artificial airway meaning that they have different driving pressures but the same flow series resistance combined like compliance in parallel the total resistance of series connection is more than that of any components. Okay, mini clinic. Remember, mini clinics are very helpful to understand because those are situations. So helium and oxygen therapy for large airway obstruction. So they, they're telling you here they're gonna use helium with oxygen because of a large airway obstruction. There is an obstruction to the airway. Okay, so the patients with significant obstruction in the upper airway trachea or main stem bronchi expend a large amount of energy overcoming the resistance to breathing. So those patients who have a large upper airway obstruction will have very hard time getting the air into their lungs. What type of gas therapy would be most advantageous in this situation? So they're asking you which uh, therapy can be an advantage to lessen the obstruction, not to lessen the obstruction, but to make it easy for them to breathe. 
because most approximately 80% of the resistance debris that occurs in the upper and large airways, disease process that increase resistance in these airways cause tremendous increase in the work of breathing. Vocal cord edema. So they have a vocal cord edema, which is an upper airway obstruction. So tumor in the trachea or a tumor in the trachea, a foregen body, that means they swallowed the thing, something that they swallowed any any um foreign like a bone or something that they swallowed. It could be anything. Kids sometimes like will swallow little little small toys they were playing with. So that's why they mean about foregen bodies. And main stem bronchi are examples of a type of clinical conditions that can markedly increase the work of breathing. Patients who must breathe against high levels of resistance are prone to respiratory muscle fatigue and failure. So they're saying once you have that resistance, now you have another. Remember, we already said 80% of resistance in your upper airways. Now, this situation they're telling you, in patients with vocal cord edema, their vocal cords are swollen, or patients with a tumor in their trachea, or a patient with a foregen bodies in, their, in the stem branchi, they have very, now they added to that 80% resistance, now they can't breathe. Since they can't breathe because there's a lot of, of resistance to the air that they're trying to get in, so they can become fatigued because they're breathing so heavy that their muscles would get tired and then respiratory failure will occur. And if it's not addressed as soon as possible, the patient can die from this. Now, gas flow in the upper airway in the large airways is predominantly turbulent. Predominantly turbulent, okay? Turbulent flow is kind of like this. It's not in a straight line. It means it goes all over. Laminar flow goes like this, it goes straight, okay? That's where, so in the upper airway, the flow is like this. It's turbulent, it goes from side to side. So imagine now you have an obstruction already that is blocking this air, and it's already like turbulent. So it's, it's gonna be a bad situation. So turbulent flow is highly influenced by gas density. So it is due to the gas density. Patients with large airway obstruction often can be treated with a mixture of helium and oxygen, which is heliox. Helium and oxygen usually can, uh, well, usually in 80 to 20, 70 to 30 mixtures can be administered to reduce the work of breathing until the obstructor process can be treated. Helium with oxygen Mixture does little for patients with small airway obstruction as occurs in, in, in patients uh, emphysema or, or asthma patients. So it doesn't work because they have these patients. So helium, heliox therapy, helium and oxygen is not a good therapy for patients who have uh, small airways resistance, like the patients with asthma or emphysema. But flow in the small airways is mainly laminar. This is what I was just saying, the air is like this. So this flow in the small airways is laminar. So you will get a question where we will see laminar flow and that will be in the small airways. That can be asked by a teacher in a, in a test or a quiz. And large, largely independent of density of gas breathed. Okay, however, heliox therapy can be used to uh, for patients with small airway obstruction to allow them to exercise longer and more uh, strenuously with less dyspnea and dynamic hyperinflation. Okay. Okay, now let's keep reading. Factors affecting resistance. The two main patterns that characterize the flow of gas through the respiratory tract, a laminar flow and turbulent flow, chapter six. So if you wanna read more on laminar flow and turbulent flow, please go to chapter six, refer to chapter six. A third pattern, tracheobronchial flow, is combination of laminar and turbulent flow. Laminar flow requires less driving pressure than turbulent flow. 
Pasul's equation, which is in chapter six, describes laminar flow through a smooth, unbranched tube of fi uh, fixed dimensions, length and radius. This equation says that for gas flow to remain constant, the pressure is inversely proportional to the fourth power of airways radius. This is by reducing the radius of tube by half which is a 16-fold pressure increase to maintain a constant flow of 16. Clinically, this means that the, to maintain ventilation in the presence of narrowing airways, large increase in driving pressure may be needed, resulting in a marked increase in the work of breathing. This is very important, where they say 16-fold. This is very important. You need to know this for the test, because this, in every test, I've seen in a lot of schools they use this, they ask this uh, question about Pasul's equation, and the answer is most of the time they, they, they put the 16 fold number in there. Okay. Rule of thumb a change in the radius of airway by a factor by two causes a 16 fold change in resistance. This rule applies to human airways and artificial airway. In the tracheal, endotracheal and tracheostomy tube if the if the size of the patient airway is reduced from two millimeter to one millimeter airway resistance increases by a factor of 16 similarly if 0.5 millimeter endotracheal tube is replaced with a nine millimeter tube the pressure required to cause a flow of one liter per second through the tube decreases by 16 fold this rule has a many practical consequences it is the basis for bronchodilator therapy and for using large particle size of artificial airway. Okay, so this has to do this equation. So they're saying if 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 the size of a tube, let's say you're using an endotracheal tube, which is going to be called an ET tube. That's an ET tube. If the size of it is size, let's say seven point five, right? If you reduce this tube to a size 6.5, you have to have in mind always that the resistance will increase because now the, the, the opening of it, it's smaller now. It's 6.5. So they're saying it increases by 16 fold. So expect to double or more than double of the resistance. However, what I've seen in clinical, in the hospitals, sometimes you will have to reduce the size of the E2 tube, especially if they have vocal cord edema and you can't get the E2 tube through the vocal cords. So you have no choice but to get the, the to reduce the size, even though it's gonna give you uh, increased resistance, but you need to ventilate your patient. So have that in mind. Distribution of resistance, approximately 80% of the resistance to gas flow occurs in the nose, mouth, and large airways, where flow is mainly turbulent. Just remember upper airways and remember turbulent flow. Only approximately 20% of total resistance to flow is attributable to attributable, attributable to airways smaller than two diameter. Where flow is mainly laminar, this fact seems to conduct the fact that resistance is inversely related to the radius of the conducting tube. Branching of the bronchial of the tracheal bronchial tree increases the cross-sectional area with each airway generation as gas moves from the mouth to the alveoli. The combined cross-sectional area of airways increases exponentially. Turbulent flow pr predominates in the mouth, trachea, and primary bronchi. Gas velocity is high in the, in the bigger airways, favoring turbulent flow patterns. As we move deeper into the lung segment, the airway branch into smaller but more airways and, and more cross-sectional area. At the level of the terminal bronchioles, the cross-sectional area increases more than 30-fold. The arrangement of the branches at the same bronchial generation in small pair compared to size, thus increasing the 
the total resistance according to the laws of fluid dynamic this increase in sectional area causes a decrease in gas velocity the velocity of gas flow resistance in a bronching in a branching system arranged in parallel is inversely related to the cross sectional area of airways the decrease in gas velocity promotes laminar flow pattern particularly in a smaller airways the resistance to flow in these small areas is then very slow the driving pressure across this airways is less than one percent of the total driving pressure for the system we must remember that the diameter of the airway is not constant during the ventilator cycle ventilatory cycle during inspiration the stretch of surrounding lung tissue in widening transpulmonary pressure gradient increase the diameter of the airways the increase in airway diameter with increasing lung volume decreasing airway resistance as lung volume decreases to res residual volume airway diameters also decrease in airways resistance that dramatically increases this explains why wheezing is most often heard during exhalation constant means that flow at the airway opening is zero no we'll, we'll stop here so with this paragraph and also here also this whole paragraph what they're telling you is now when when the air is turbulent it air is mostly turbulent in the upper airway that's what they're saying here mainly in the upper airway when the air is turbulent there's less there's more resistance but when it gets to the to the to the lower airways because the diameter decreases the diameter of the opening of your airway decreases it goes down what happens that the, the the air is not turbulent anymore it becomes laminar flow when it becomes laminar flow like this it tends to have less resistance at the lower airways so when it's less resistance it's also the velocity of it increases and the best way to remember this is if you has a if you have a hose and you open the water uh how can i describe this okay for me to describe it to help you understand it i will go downstairs to my basement and i'll open the hose and i'm gonna tell you what i mean i'm gonna show you actually so let's go down so i'm gonna block this for now And I'm gonna put on my shoes and I'm gonna go downstairs to the basement so I can show you what I mean. Okay, so I'm gonna open the water. Okay, so this is a hose where I open the water, right? So in the upper airways, you have turbulent flow. The flow is like this. Therefore, resistance will be higher because you can block it easily. So any little object, well, this is, let's say this is a turbulent flow. Any object will block it, right? Like I'm putting my finger, it's easy to block it. But when it gets to the smaller airways, the diameter of the airway 
gets smaller, like the hose right here, this diameter, if we lower it by half, you will see I have increased the flow. And the flow will become laminar. As it go down to the airway of the lung, if I block it, I double it by half, the, the, the flow becomes laminar. Also, resistance will become less because velocity has increased. So, once the velocity increases, it will be less resistance at the lower airways. So, the flow will become laminar, and that's the Soule's law, because you, you decrease the radius, the diameter, the radius right here, okay? Hopefully, this, this helped you understand what I'm talking about. So, when you get a test question, turbulent flow is always going to be in the upper airways and the large airways. We're gonna talk about the nose, the trachea, and uh, the two bronchi. So, but laminar flow is gonna be always at where? At the lower airways, uh, at the uh, uh, bronchioles, okay? At level, where the tree branches down all the way, and that's where it's gonna be. Now let me turn off the water. Okay, so that was that. Okay, that was turbulent and laminar flow. Okay, as you can see, distribution of air resistance, nose, mouth, upper airway, trachea, and bronchi, and small airways. So you see these small airways is only 20%, 20% of the total resistance. And as you can see, because of, of, of the, the, the gas or the flow of air that is going to your lung, once it gets to your small airways, the resistance gets less because remember when I was squeezing the the, um, the hose, when I was squeezing it, that the flow was getting, uh, velocity was increasing. It was faster. It was going faster. So it will be able to push faster. So it will be less resistance. But at the upper airway, 50% uh, fifty percent is the resistance because the air is turbulent at the, uh, at the upper airway. was talking about the same thing, mechanical of the excavation. This will go back. Oh, this is the end. So we will go up to here and this will be a different topic. Mechanics of exhalation will be the next video. So this year we'll talk about static versus dynamic mechanics. A person who has a good knowledge of physics will understand this easier, more than me, actually even better than me. Resistance in compliance can be evaluated under static or dynamic conditions. 
The term static implies that the flow throughout of the respiratory system throughout the respiratory system has ceased and all ventilator muscles activity is absent. Static conditions can be imposed with inspiratory pause when a patient is sedated and being mechanically ventilated. In contrast, the term dynamic in this context means that flow at the airway opening is zero. Mechanics also evaluate under dynamic conditions, for example, when a non-intubated patient breathes spontaneously. In this case, the pressure difference uses to calculate lung resistance and elastance, driving pressure instead of an okay. In a single com compartment model, estimation of resistance and compliance under static and dynamic conditions use the same values. However, in a real respiratory system, opposed of multiple compartments with different time constants, each compartment being a resistance in series with the compliance. Mechanics estimated during static conditions yield different values than when evaluated during dynamic conditions. For a multiple compartment system, when flow is zero at the airway opening, there may still be flow between components, pendeluft. As a result, dynamic mechanics become dependent on respiratory frequency. Typically, both compliance and resistance decrease as frequency increases. Okay. Typically, both compliance and resistance decrease as frequency increases. Okay. All right, we're going to stop here for today. At the mechanics of exhalation. And thank you so much for watching. Please leave a comment below if, you, uh, if I said something that wasn't right or I explained a, a concept wrong. Let me know so I can correct it. And forgive me if I made a mistake. Thank you so much for watching.